Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the photoelectric effect. So I do want to start off by talking about light and ask what is light like and what are some of its properties. Hopefully you find light to be beautiful. I know I do, especially how light plays on water and just does amazing things. There's a lot of beauty and a lot of physics all wrapped up together. So let's start, though, by talking about properties of light. So first of all, maybe you're a physics student or an AP physics student or even a physical science student. And at this stage of the year, we have talked about these different properties of light. And one of the things that's fascinating about this is by 1905, we had discovered and worked out different properties of light here and we had figured out that light is behaving like a wave and it still does with all of these phenomena so it has wave-like properties you could say but there were experiments done with something called the photoelectric effect which seemed to cause problems because what we expected to see light as a wave was not what we were seeing and this is one of the things that Albert Einstein became famous for he got the Nobel Prize for was figuring out that light actually is not behaving like a wave for this phenomenon that we're going to be talking about called the photoelectric effect. What is the photoelectric effect? Well, there was a scientist named Heinrich Ertz who discovered the photoelectric effect in 1887. He could not really explain what was happening because he was still of the mindset that we are thinking of light, electromagnetic waves, as completely just as wave-based phenomena. But what he found is when he shone light of different wavelengths or different frequencies, or you could say different colors, on metal surfaces, you would in some cases get electrons being ejected off of the surface. And in some cases, you would not have electrons being knocked off of the surface, which led to problems. And so let's take a moment to think about what we observed. What we observed did not match what was expected. So first of all, we would expect that whether or not electrons are ejected from a metal surface would depend on the intensity of the light, so how bright the light was, meaning the overall effect of the wave of light hitting it could be enough to knock off electrons, and that would make sense. So secondly, we expected that the kinetic energy of electrons depends on the intensity of the light. What does that mean? Well, the brighter the light is, the faster the ejected electrons would go. That would be a reasonable expectation if we continue to think about light as simply a wave. Lastly, our prediction was is that at low intensities, electron ejection would just take some time. It would just take longer to knock those off. But if you're thinking about light as a giant wave, as just a wave of energy, it would be enough to knock off electrons. We're talking about the binding energy of electrons. So electrons are bound to atoms because of the positive charges that are in the nucleus of atoms. So that has to be overcome with some energy. You have to knock the electron off of the atom, so to speak. However, that is exactly what we did not find. So first of all, whether electrons were ejected from the photoelectric effect from shining light on metal, we figured out that the frequency of the light was the thing that determines whether electrons were ejected. So if you used a lower frequency light, like towards the red end of the spectrum, then you wouldn't maybe have any electrons being ejected off, depending on the metal. And if you use something of a higher frequency, like towards the purple or violet end of the spectrum, you would get electrons electrons being ejected off. Secondly, the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons depends on also the frequency of the light. It does not depend on the light as a wave. It depends on the fundamental properties of the light radiation that's coming in. Lastly, if we take a look down here, at low intensities, electron ejection can still occur. So even in dim light, if you happen to have dim light of a high enough frequency, like dim light towards the violet end of the spectrum, can kick off electrons, and that can happen almost instantaneously. So what we're seeing is our experimental evidence does not make sense if we think of light as simply a wave. Light here is behaving more like a particle. And scientists could just not figure this out. They couldn't wrap their minds around that light, in some cases, behave like waves, and in some cases, behaves like a particle. So it took Einstein to be able to figure that out. And I do want to talk a little bit more about it. So with this visualization, by the way, when we say photoelectric, we're talking about light dealing with electricity or electrons specifically here. And so with this graphic, we're going to say that this red wave does not have enough energy or a high enough frequency to eject an electron. The green wave does, though, 
and the purple wave does. So this is a higher frequency, this is a higher energy wave that's coming in and it's kicking off. Now it doesn't matter how many red waves we have, even if we have a billion of these over a square centimeter or something like that, you still have zero electrons being kicked off. So in that sense, it really doesn't matter what the overall wave is doing. It just matters that the individual wavelet or little packet of light energy is just not energetic enough. And this is how Einstein started thinking about this as a packet of light energy. In fact, there's a name for this. The smallest unit of light you can have is called a photon. And we say that light is quantized. What does that mean? That means you can have the smallest packet of light possible. It's either you have a photon or you do not have a photon. You can't get half a photon. So it turns out that we used to think that you can divide light into smaller and smaller ways forever and ever, but that's not true. Light is quantized, and so there is a smallest unit or packet of light called a photon. Now the energy of the photon depends on something called Planck's constant right here, multiplied by the frequency. So this is the version of the equation I'm going to use. Historically, this is a version of the equation that was used, so you will see this in like university level physics classes sometimes. I think that this is confusing because this to me looks like a V. It's supposed to be nu, Greek letter nu, and it's supposed to represent frequency. When I think of frequency, I represent it as an F. So does the College Board, and it's consistent, and it leads to less confusion because we do have a wave speed equation that uses V. This and this equation is actually not V. So I'm going to move on from this and use this version of the equation. This is Planck's constant right here, and so that is going to be the amount of energy. This right here is going to be the amount of energy in the photon. All right, well, if that's the case, we can work with this. We can say this is our energy of the photon. Now, it takes a certain amount of work to be able to eject an electron, and that's going to be called our work function. So to free an electron from its metallic atom, it takes work. It takes energy to do that. And it can only be at some special frequency or higher for that metal. That frequency is called the threshold frequency. In other words, it has to be like towards the violet end of the spectrum to work. If you use something beneath that in terms of the frequency, like towards the red end of the spectrum, it will simply not work. You won't have enough energy to be able to do this. And any of the energy left over is going to be the maximum kinetic energy of the electron that's kicked off of the atom. So we can rearrange this equation, and if we do rearrange it for the kinetic energy of the kicked off electron, and we remember that this is going to be Planck's constant, then we can work with this. I will mention that there is another unit that we need to be aware of. It's called an electron volt. So an electron volt is equal to the amount of energy an electron or proton gains when it's accelerated through one volt of potential difference. All right, so let's see how this works out with an example problem. So first of all, this problem says a sodium surface is illuminated with light with a frequency of 1 times 10 to the 15 hertz. The work function of sodium is 2.28 electron volts. Find the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons in electron volts. All right, so we're going to go ahead and isolate for kinetic energy max. And so we've gone ahead and done that. Next up, we're going to notice that we need to answer in electron volts, and we're given the work function in electron volts. So let's go ahead and just say, well, that's our work function right there in electron volts, and we need to take this and convert between Planck's constant that's in joules times seconds into electron volts. And so that's what I've done down here. And you can solve now once you get your units to be the same in a very easy way. So that problem is helpful because it also shows the conversion between Planck's constant in one form and another. All right, so hopefully this has been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.